yeah, this is Coffee Compiler Club, and normally everything to do with compilers and language runtimes, and I just got back from Burning Man, so we've been chatting Burning Man. But, uh, you know, whatever it goes, no set agenda, you're being recorded, shows up on YouTube within, you know, an hour to a week. Um, that's my, that's my, that's my, in my spiel. If anyone wants to ask Burning Man questions, we'll do that. Otherwise we can, I don't have any, any agenda here. I'm like working on AA overloads, um, but they're kind of winding down. I think they're, they're going to be done. Overloads as in uh, invocation. Yeah, overloads as in uh, ad hoc polymorphism. So small count ad hoc polymorphism. Um, it, it there's a collection of things that, when used, uh, uh, the the collection the, the correct element from the collection can always be determined by the usage. And if it can't, then you're ambiguous, and that's an error. So it's type safe overloads, and and people think typically functions, but you know, I want to say not Theodore was the the darn it, the other guy's not here. So somebody last last time I was on said, well, I'm gonna just make a, a you know function that returns anything since you're gonna make it match correctly anyhow. And sure enough, I thought about that so that'll work. It was Alan. So so near as I can tell, overloads take any two things. Like I make an overload called red. And it has the, the hexadecimal value for the red color, and it has a string called quote red quote. And I can always tell apart which red I mean from context. And so, you know, it's type safe, untagged unions, what it amounts to. And in the, the first use case for me is for doing uh, integer float widening on, on primitive operators. You use a primitive add you know sorry you, you pull up the add operator the add function whatever and i i look at it's an overload and i have a couple different overloads and one takes float plus float one takes int plus float one takes float plus int one takes int plus int and i go sort out which one you meant by the the context and you get one of the four choices as the only choice that matters and gets you know it gets picked by the typing system so it's a way to do Type safe overloads of primitive math. That's, that was my drive to get started. Type safe overloads of primitive math. If you look at like Haskell and, and I mean, pretty much any functional language, and they all have these great things going around everywhere, right up until it comes to int float widening, where there's always some weird hack. Haskell ended up with type classes, um, and, and you get a, a type safe, but the compiler, the typing system cannot guarantee you that you won't have a virtual call. Instead, the optimizer probably mostly gets the virtual call devirtualized and you're done. But near as I can tell, type classes might still do some sort of indirect call and you're hoping the optimizer does it. And with my polymorphic overloads, the typing system will guarantee you a hard, correct choice, no virtual call. So you get a direct call, which can be inline. So you get a hard guarantee of performance. And that's sort of a difference, I think, between type classes and overloads here. And probably they'll go exponential if you try hard. And so I'm saying small count overloads because I'm I'm probably have to do it's either quadratic or exponential. I think I can get away with quadratic. So as long as you know your your, your count is two, three, four, and you're quadratic, you don't care. If your count's a thousand and you go quadratic, you probably care. So don't overload a thousand things that can be typed safely chosen between, but you know, but requires hard work to figure it out. Whereas the two, three, four case, I think is pretty obvious and pretty easy, just having two arguments. So there's four choices, you know, two types, two arguments, four choices. But this would handle shit like overloads with arrays on arrays and arrays versus scalars to do scalar math things. Um, <coughs> I can probably make it work right with on those uh, on those types of runaway problems for for not being able to predict time. Um, you know, the, the, the question is, is, you know, so some languages will choose an algorithm that has predictable time. Some will, you know, set an arbitrary limit of like, you know, you can't do more than three or whatever. And then, you know, so we ended up choosing just to time box the entire compilation instead right so like if you can manage the, the resources the compilation let the developer do whatever crazy thing they want to it's 
if it happens within whatever CPU time they're allocated or that they've limited to. Then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm of the, of the zone here is I want to give you a cost model and tell you when it can guarantee certain costs and when it can't. For execution or compilation? Execution. So for me, it's important that you get a hard guarantee that an ad you wrote in the code turns into that in, Intel x86 ad instruction and no extra overheads. So you get that guarantee no matter what you do in and around here. You can't you can't lose it without basically asking the type system permission to do something stupid. That is do you say, ever just give up and go megamorphic? On on yes, yes. And in most megamorphic calls are obviously megamorphic from their usage, and you don't need to ask permission. So there, there's like this thing in my head that's not implemented. There's this thing in my head that says. There's a set of things that I'll let you do that you, you I expect you to know will be expensive and, and maybe I can make them fast optimizer, but the typing system can't guarantee they're cheap. And then there's a set of things where you expect it to be cheap, but there are things you might accidentally do which will make it expensive. So auto boxing in Java, for instance. Hey, I'm doing integer ads. I expect this to be one clock cycle. If instead I accidentally auto box somewhere, suddenly it's much more expensive. And, and in my, you know, my mindset of where I want to go here, I want to say, you don't get auto boxing for free unless you say, I want to be easy coding, not fast coding. And that's a scoped lexical change in the language spec that basically says, if you're fast coding and you want to auto box, the typing system says, hey, I have to auto box here. And, and this is supposed to be fast, so no, it's a compiler error. And then you change it to say, I'm going to be easy coding, and then the whole fast question goes out the window, and I auto box for you, and away you go. And there are times when I care to be fast, and at times I'd rather be easy. And, you know, and, and I... That's a, that's a strong statement for the compiler. Being not fast is a compiler error. <laughs> yeah. No, no. So it's all it's all easy if I'm writing little one-offs and who cares? And that's the easy code. Mm -hmm. And if I'm walking through a billion element data set, I want the fast code and the inner loops. Yeah. So, so how do you tell the code which you want? Oh, so so the the, the keyword at the lexical scoping level. Uh -huh. That would be the obvious way to go. I haven't I haven't sorted out a syntax here. The, the current decision in my head is that I'm going to support this, which means I have to know that I can give you the fast or I can't give you the fast. So like the, the auto boxing thing for me, I'm only going to auto box if you want to jam primitives of unrelated types into the same shared array, basically. Something can something work like the hmm. Uh, the rest macros uh, fast with a block. Anything inside the block cannot be boxed or fast, comma, no yeah. auto boxing. Anything inside is not permitted right. to box. This would be language lexical scoping, but it's not a <laughs> macro expansion, although. No, not macro. I, I meant the style in the, in the unsafe and inside the code is unsafe. Here, the fast inside the block yeah. is, it would. There, there's some syntax yet to be figured out that says, this code changes the typing rules from mm -hmm. easy to fast. Yeah. That would be a good way to do it, at least to me. Fast and inside the block the code yeah. should be okay. And, and I, could, I could go a step further and say that, that there's a version of, of fast and easy that overrides each other as you nest, and then there's a version that disallows that. Um, like, like suppose I'm, I'm writing sort of some embedded system and I don't have any allocation mechanism except what allocate the start of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, I, then I want a version of coding that says it's an error to try to allocate, which would without, you know, try to allocate actually, whereas the typing system can often prove that I can update in place and there's no allocation of what looks like conceptually new objects, but that's just update in place. That's okay. Update in place is mm -hmm. fine. But if you actually have to allocate, then I can't allocate because this embedded system doesn't have any mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. So it's an error. And, and it's a non-overridable error. I can't lexically scope my way and say, and inside here, I'm going to allow allocation because I have no OS backing call. So give me some more memory. There is no more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So there, there are other uses for scope rules of changing the language spec and adding or subtracting, you know, features in in the scoping areas. Yeah. But there are times when you'd probably want a softer version of that where at startup, I do a bunch of easy and then, you know, I start high speed trading and no allocations and then right. I hit an error and it's like, okay, stop all of the trades. Now go back to easy mode for figuring out what happened. So, so the, the, the lexical scoping. So if you, if you're in that zone, you would say, I start easy. Like the default compilation is probably easy. You've nested a scope for fast. You had some error and now you need to figure something out. It's an error. So there's some bad situations, something complicated. You leave the fast scope and you go back to some easy scope, do your thing and then re-enter the fast scope. That would be a way to do it. Yeah, so I wrote an example in the, in the doc for what- I haven't looked at docs here. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's a, just a sketch, just a mock. Hmm. Yeah, right. And, and, and so there's a function call that you've, alloc you've annotated with fast and no box and no alloc or whatever it's gonna be. And one calls the other and either exits out and then you're going to re-enter it or you allow the fast to nest, but probably you'd rather have actually exit out because the, the, my, my typical view in these things is if I have an error in the fast code, I can't handle it in the mindset of the fast code. I have to get a bigger picture. So I want to be <laughs> out of the fast code. The fast code tests a bunch of assertions, validates the universe is a certain way, and because it's a certain way, it can cheat and go fast. Mm -hmm. So this algorithmic speeds going on in here, as well as like no allocation and no boxing. Okay, that's failed. So now I want to unwind and go back to the big picture and reassert my assertions before I re-enter the fast code, however that's done. Yeah, there, there have to be some resolution between the fast block and the bigger scope. There have to be some handling there. Right, so so if I allow you to override fast with easy, maybe that's okay and you can nest easy inside fast, but there might be a version of fast that says, you can't override and I don't care. These same things, by the way, go with um, safety on foreign functions and the like, security issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I could say inside this scope, you can't run eval or you can't make a foreign function call. Or if you do make a foreign function call, that mm -hmm. FFI becomes part of your trusted computing base. And somewhere you have to list your trusted computing base and I'll only let you call things in your trusted computing base. So some mm -hmm. random code I pulled over the internet in my browser and wants to evaluate is not allowed to call an unknown FFI mm -hmm. because you know he's outside my trusted computing base and he's calling something that I don't understand what the trust you know, consequences are. So I say no. And that's a, that can be a language spec. Thing, a, a type safety, so not like type safety spec. Long, long haul from overloads. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, right now with overload things, I'm 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 fiddling around with progress issues for the incremental performance of the typing algorithm, keeping it incremental. There's there's little bits of failed progress I'm, I'm just at the tail end of. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's like there, I think I can, as long as your, your any individual overload is small count, you know, your running time will be probably quadratic on these small count of overloads, um, probably in a small region as well, this is whatever uses the overloads, and that'll be just be it. Uh, and everything else will be back to linear. So interesting. Linear because it tries one overload after the other. It tries the um, Yeah, so I say linear. So I, I should say linear in the size of the final tie. That's my mm -hmm. that's my current observation. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at Henley Milner uh, theor theoretical tie uh, performance, people give me numbers that are like much, much huger. Mm -hmm. And I did a hack on Henley Milner to remove one of the asymptotic it, it, memoization hack. It looks like it removes one of the asymptotic values on it. So some test cases of pull of the internet that give a at least a quadratic growth in the type do in fact take longer mm -hmm. as expected. Um, most things I'm doing here 
seem to iterate a linear count of times to the work less, making incremental progress. So they pull things off the work less and they either do nothing or they make an incremental progress and the neighbors go on the work list and you, you allow the rinse repeat. The end result is things go on the work list two, three, four times, and then mm -hmm. they're done. They never go on the work list again. So it appears to be, you know, running time is typically two, three, four steps times size of program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and of course I have a tiny sample case and mm -hmm. and I have it pushed the the big bad cases hard. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It mm -hmm. appears to be pretty good right now. Hmm. It should be fast enough. Uh, so, yeah, I'm hoping so. I believe so. Mm. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's like not it's not the usual way to run Henley Milner and of course this is all in the, the, the theoretical version which does an abstract syntax tree mm -hmm. followed by I need to have an SSA style to be incremental there's there's non-local updates going on so I, I patch a fake here I'm just trying to get out of the sunlight I'm not getting blind here I patch a, a bunch of SSA like edges into the abstract syntax tree and the combination is an ugly thing and the mm -hmm. core AA just is SSA all the way and has all the, the correct def use edges built in as its core main data structure and so it's a hell of a lot easier to code and see progress on so the tree version has a complicated stupid progress story because I started with a tree instead of just going straight to SSA it makes my it makes my progress efforts Slow, longer, slower, whatever it takes. It takes a little longer to get the bugs out for progress. When you say progress, you mean like showing a progress bar to the user for the compile? No, it's incremental. And so to be, you have to correctly have the set of things that need to be investigated on your work list. So if I visit some node and I do whatever thing I do, so I run a Henley Milner step and some types get unified and some types grow then this impacts other places in the program who now need to check that their types are going to change because their input types have just changed. So progress means that they went on the work. So progress here means I, I don't, the classic Henry Milner is one walk through an AST and there's no question about progress. You're going to visit everything exactly once and only once. And the things I'm doing here, that doesn't work because I have other effects going on that are outside the normal Henley Milner like effects, you cannot do it in one pass. So if you can't do it in one pass, another way to do it is say four until no more progress, repeat passes. But that immediately goes to like quadratic and above because you, you have to keep revisiting and revisiting the whole tree. Yeah. But most of the tree is not changing. It's just little tiny bits are percolating their, their, their changes around. So progress here means I got the correct set of things on the work list to be visited again where the correct set of things is sort of non-obvious or non-local because the problem's non-local. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work the way that the standard algorithm W or algorithm J works. It, it, it's more complicated. Okay, fine. So all it means now is what's it mean to be a neighbor that goes on your work list or adjacent to do work? Well, it's a complicated story. So I did a complicated act that looks simple on paper, but keeping it correct is difficult. So when I say a progress bug, what it really happens is after I do a small step, I pull something off the work list and I, I visit it and see if I can do an update. And then I do my progress updates. I push things on the work list according to whatever neighbors. I now revisit the entire program and confirm that everyone who could make progress is in fact on the work list without actually having them make progress. I just test, they could make progress. So my testing strategy is quadratic. And that pops up you know, immediately after doing this step, now I, I fail the progress test, which means, oh, this step should have put some other guy on the work list. It's not obvious. And then I have to figure out how the hell he was supposed to be connected to this other guy and why I didn't pick him up already. And that's the progress bugs. So it's not a progress bar to the user. It's it's just making sure that I have progress in yeah. making the type resolution progress from the yeah, types. Yeah, progress on type resolution. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I started this with you know the obvious. Hey, I'll have a work list. I put the obvious things on, and then after a while, I kept finding places where I, I had bugs in that. So I then I did a, a, a at the end of it all, I test make sure no one else can make more progress. I know things popped up, and then where and where did they fail to get on the work list? Well, that's being difficult to track. So then I did it incrementally. 
and that make my, my test running time quadratic and the size of the program. But the, all the tests I have are modestly sized, like the biggest ones, like 30 or 50 lines of code. So, man, you know, just pay the quadratic cost. And now all my all my bugs are caught sort of instantly after making a small step. And uh, and then the next thing I do is I, I scramble the work list and try again because a different visitation order might trigger a bug a different way. So and I, cycles I in the structure has to be dealt with. Yeah, things visit in different orders, and and so you 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 know in theory, well in theory, in 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 practice here, I should hit the same final answer every time, no matter what order I visit things. So this is like the the one step church roster property. Mm -hmm. But now actually engineer your way to the one step church roster property. Well, I might visit A before B, and thus I have to do this step. I might visit B before A and have to do that step. And I have to have both of those steps in place and working. And they're they're a little different because it's A happened first and then B, or B happened first and A. Whatever. So you know, I visit a lambda and then I visit an application of the lambda, or I visit the application and then I visit the lambda. And there's two different pieces of code depending on what who who got there first. And they both have to end up with the same answer. And, and so the mm -hmm. workless scrambling makes you try all different combinations. Is it going to make things more complicated if you try and let two threads? churn on the work list at the same time? Well, my goal here is to be fast enough that two threads won't make a difference, that, that they're not worth it. Um, so if I, we had this talk a bunch, once or twice here, but I've had it in the long prior history many, many times, like, can we go faster? So if you look at the C2, C of nodes compile speed, um, when it's doing C of nodes updates, that's like 10% of the total compilation speed. And it's already like, super fast compared to every other optimizing compiler on the planet. So the overheads of having a thread step in there and work on the small piece of work and step out and, and dance around each other without killing each other, it's, it's you know, the locking and unlocking costs are gonna exceed the, the value you would get of having you know a fast single thread. So, so that's a, been- the, I had a dream last night on this very topic. <laughs> I was actually trying to measure, I was trying to estimate whether it made sense in an operating system to allocate an entire core just for thread scheduling. Because, because if all the data structures are local, why would you ever give up the core and just, just keep scheduling out in front of the other cores, basically? And so at what point, I was trying to estimate how many cores you'd need, at which point it would be obvious that you would never want the scheduler to get off the core. Anyway. So yeah, Azul, Azul, in this scenario, problem. are you on an Azul box? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, Azul has that problem. We had the thousand core machine. So at some point, somebody's trying to schedule something and you had to decide whether it was more efficient. Okay. To... But we're not that far away from having a thousand cores on your watch. It's getting there, right, right. I mean, I you're still you're still a couple orders of magnitude, but only one or one and a half, you know, like like I think most people get like eight or sixteen commonly. Um, in a notebook, get to like 128 commonly, new things want to get privately burned a core all the time. Four per core, two cores on a socket, four sockets on a motherboard. You get there, right? Right, right. So it's four sockets, two threads per core. And how many to get 128? What's that times eight? You need like 16 or 32 cores on a die, each hyper-threaded to the 64, no, 16 cores on a die, each hyper-threaded 32 times four die on a motherboard at 128. Yeah, you get there. You also do shit like hot burn threads spinning for IO. Like the, the, the you know, this is uh, um, Martin Thompson's, you know, solar flare networking card shit going on where you're trying to do lowest latency IO of a network. Um, Burn an x86 core, just you know, staring at hot bits, saying new new data has showed up, and then does the shuffle through the OS however fast it needs to. But you lost a core in exchange for dropping a context switch overhead, however many you know microseconds long a context switch takes in order. Yeah, to so a, a dual socket now handles uh, 512 concurrent hardware threads. Oh, where'd you get that from? Dual socket, right? Um, six per 
So, yeah, I mean, you generally don't go above dual socket except for specialized workloads okay. because the, uh, the cost goes up by um, like eight to 10 X for the okay. third socket. It just doesn't make any sense. But uh, your highest core count right now is 128, which is 256 threads. It's Epic, E-P-Y-C. Oh, I haven't and, looked at uh, this. Is uh, this from Intel, you mean? No, AMD. Oh, AMD? AMD. How, how, how weeny are they? Interesting. I have not seen this. Yeah, it's it's called the Zen 4C, um, Bergamo. Um, yeah. Probably can't get it in retail yet, but it's it's available. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, fine. You know, 15, 20 years later, starting to get close. All the oh, yeah. but you didn't do it on numbers. you didn't do it on two sockets though. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, okay. Azul was getting um didn't you have 24 or 40 cores per socket or something? 40, 48. 48. Last generation, we, we had such good they, they added an extra core for every eight for redundancy, but the last yield was so good we just left them on all the time. So it was 54. So odd numbers, but no one cared. But yeah, 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 getting there, fine. Now are they more more beefy than a, a Zool core? <laughs> so they are. They're they're very beefy. I mean, they're x eighty six cores. No, um, no, no. X eighty six has got beefy because of process. We, AMD probably has process good. We 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 are always you know two generations behind process because we had to yeah, borrow the process. I think these are going to be at three nanometer. Right. Uh, what's their what's their either three or they're, no, they may be four. These are well, but you you know that when they say three or four nanometer, it doesn't actually refer to anything. Yeah, I know. It's, it's it's actually a made up number. Yeah. So here's um, the clock rate somewhere between two and a half and three and a half, according to where you land in their chart. Yep. Okay. They'll burst up to five, but generally generally they keep them right. down because of the heat. And, and uh, Azul's were clocking like 750 at their max, 750 megahertz. So this is like 4x the clock rate, which, yeah, totally. That was what we were hurting on is clock rate. We were too too far behind the process generation, couldn't get our clock rate up. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, uh, it was also, I mean, the, the interface to your CPUs was a network connection, Ethernet. <laughs> um that wasn't ultimately the problem it was for some workloads because um because we we tested pretty heavily on the on the uh Azure. Oh, okay. I, I have to see what you were doing then because we kept looking at network, shit. network software oh as a as a straight up network software yeah well we were trying to be plug and play on a on an x86 system running uh yeah. a jvm and so we had to have a well, i tried to convince gil to put it on a uh to keep the same, is it PHY or whatever? To keep the same architecture, but stick it on a card in a PCI slot. So instead of having a thousand CPU box, you know, do a twenty-four CPU card. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I love that yeah. stuff. All right, yeah, I shouldn't revisit that one. That's too much water on the bridge. It would have been, would have, could have, should have been fun. I had a ball working on that chip, but unfortunately, you know, here I am now. So I put a link in the doc, by the way. This is the only language thing I have to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, changing. Well, you can talk about range operators. Yeah. What do we what do we what's your discussion here? I'm gonna bring it up. Well, this week I saw um so we do a a fairly awkward um range operator if you're doing the top side um, exclusive. So like, for example, you know, you want to do I is zero to N, you'd say zero dot dot N, but if you want to do I zero to N minus one, you'd say for I equals, you know, for I colon hard bracket, square bracket, uh, zero dot dot N parentheses, kind of a mathematical notation. I, yeah, I hate the mixed parens because my Which, editor it's exactly. Awesome. That's actually one of the reasons we were looking to get rid of it was the uh, <laughs> your Emacs macros. Um, but it's not yeah, just Emacs. It's not just Emacs. You know, I use idea idea chokes on it. Um, so 
Uh, but I love these. Oh, uh, we, we I love really these Swift operators. We we're really changing language uh, semantics because of IDs. Yeah. Um, it, it's your common they, they influence the program, the language design. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know if any of you guys are. I think Ruby has double dot and triple dot, and that's the exclusive and inclusive. Ah. I like that's this because uh, yeah. this is uniform. This uh, the less n greater. You know the um, so because oh, no less than sign. Ah. Okay. Those look interesting too. So like, basically, you can do upper bounds or lower bounds or both, inclusive, exclusive, whatever. So I, I right. like it. Are yeah, I don't like the, 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 the mixed brackets are like painful. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Aaron, what was that? Are you dropping your examples in the doc? Oh, I, mean, I put the link. Uh, but yeah, let me, let me copy it over. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're obviously interesting. So th this is interesting because I think it was like, Three weeks ago, I actually got rid of my range operators. Uh, ah. <clears throat> I used the Ruby model, so uh, dot dot and triple dot. Uh, dot dot being uh, inclusive and triple dot being exclusive. Um, the kind of the problem I had with it is like first every language uses like a different syntax, and some of them will flip it around. So Ruby uses dot dot inclusive. In Rust, dot dot is exclusive. And if you want an inclusive range in Rust, it is dot dot equal sign. Uh, and then I think in Kotlin, if I remember correctly, I think dot dot is like inclusive. But then if you want exclusive, you have to use like keyword syntax or something. It's like X until Y, like they do something oh. different. Uh. <clears throat> um, Scala, I think, just uses methods. Um, so it's like X until Y or X to Y, things like that. But point being, um, there is no sort of consistent syntax that makes sense. Like mathematicians will probably be used to, what is it like uh, uh, flat brackets, X, Y, round brackets or whatever it was. That, that's the interval notation, the hard yeah. square brackets and the round brackets. But basically anybody who doesn't read papers for a living will be like, what, what the hell am I looking at? Those you are just as easy to mix up, I can tell you from experience. Th yeah. That also, yeah. right? Um, and so that was kind of my conclusion. Like you, you can pick whatever syntax you want, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be you know as descriptive as like the plus symbol. Like if everybody knows a plus b is the result. Right. Um, so what I ended up doing is I just get rid of them entirely, and similar to Scala, I just use methods. So it's um, I have to say correctly because I'm still trying to uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, develop uh, muscle memory. Right. Uh, I have uh, until for exclusive ranges and uh, two for inclusive ranges. Now, to be fair... Uh, How do you indicate the step size? Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> like right now, the, the way it works in my language is the, uh, the step size is defined by the type. In a sense that my ranges used to be generic. I now made them only support integers because float ranges, fairly useless, string ranges also kind of useless especially in light of unicode like yeah what yeah, is the I... range of a to some emoji um so you're basically left with integers and for that point i figured you know, might as well just have you in like your range type only support integers um yeah. the step size is still indicated uh i think it just does plus one <laughs> i just haven't you know added support for that um I will say the sort of confusing thing is like for exclusive ranges, generally, I think the English word is like until, and there's some debate. Um, but All right, generally... whoever anonymous dragon is, is cat yeah. ears operator. Yeah. <laughs> right, but, but yeah. so, you know, for, for exclusive, it's like until, I think it's usually sort of assumed to be A up until excluding B. But in including, I couldn't find A word in English that actually means that and that people consistently agree. So I just picked two. It's like, yeah, whatever. You don't really use it that often anyway. No, I mean, I, I use exclusive ranges. Uh, so, sorry, exclusive for inclusive ranges, it's two. Yeah, exclusive on the end or inclusive. I want both ends or I want to exclude the right end. It's like the 99% case where I'm thinking of a range. 
I never play the I'm skipping the first guy, I'm naming the first guy and skipping him. That that's not a thing that I end up coding. No, right. And I I found for me like exclusive ranges are probably the most common. Like if you have like a traditional for loop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, inclusive ranges are quite rare. Really I think yeah. you usually use those for like validation. Like you know, you want to have a number constrained by some range. Um, but at least in my case, I, I went even for like. So if the language in general tries to uh, push you away from using like traditional for loops, like first of all, there is no for keyword. There are no for loops. You use iterators. So that automatically cuts out like ninety nine percent of the cases where you use a range type. Uh, the, the few times you use it is, is if you want to do something like, oh, from zero up until this number, uh, do something. Like okay, repeat a loop 10 times, something like or that. Or a sub, sub range in the whole, in a large collection. <laughs> something like that, right? Uh, but even there, in my case, for things like slicing uh, a string or an array, my slice methods don't take a range type. They just take two arguments. Mm -hmm. um, so you get, you know, slice uh, zero comma four instead of some range type and it's just so you yeah. don't have to create a range just to slice something mm -hmm. well, why the... is range a special type anyway that's what i don't really understand like yeah. it's just a sequence yeah i'm with like, you now that... yeah. uh, because you don't want to uh, um, create the values in a sequence you usually say okay you have all the values materialized and in the range you usually hope to say okay i have this data type with uh, the lower value or the, the min value and the max value. And that's basically like a uh, 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 eight byte you have to shuffle around. I don't really agree with that. I mean, I do a lot of graph traversal stuff. And when, I, when you're traversing a graph, you cannot have the full ranges materialized or you'll have an infinite mm -hmm. range or infinite list of things. So you have to always iterate. Um, because you got circles and the graphs and stuff, and, and yeah, I mean that's that depends so, on the. Uh, like there's the, the difference between a function that produces uh, um, produces values on demand, like iterator style, which maybe mm -hmm. just generating them like a range does. Like, there's many ways to build those, assuming your language can support it. So why have a special type for one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it depends on the definition of sequence. If you're saying it basically a sequence is something like an array or a list, which has materialized number, uh, materialized values, you don't want that for range. Um, in the end, um, I think I if you interpret range as some kind of iterator producing things, that seems to be safer. But in the end, yeah, don't bother. I, I'm, I'm I think, completely I think the with you. Right there. One of the few things that you would use a range for. I mean, the, the, Derek, the, to answer your question, I mean, you only create a type when it has to be able to answer questions that nothing else already answers, right? So, so what does a range answer that a um, a sequence or whatever, you know? So, you know, range represents you know, a starting point and an ending point. And it knows if the starting point is inclusive or exclusive. It knows if the ending point is inclusive or exclusive. You can ask if two ranges overlap. You can ask for them to, you know, join together. You can, you know, so it has I a number of operations that are unique to the I understand to the need for a range, you know, data type at runtime, but That's I just don't I mean, understand yeah. why you need it in the type system. Well, what's the difference? No, I, I think I think what it means like you have like a dedicated, let's say, uh, syntax in your type uh, what, what, system for ranges. The, the, there's two pieces there. Right? One's a dedicated syntax, but one's a dedicated entry in the type system, as opposed to just a collection of two ints that you have a data type and it has some functions on, and it makes a range. Right. So, so I feel like having um, like having a type for a range, like as in summary in your code base, is like you know class range, uh, blah blah blah. That, that makes total sense. Uh, and effectively, it, it's you know specialized tuple of two values. Mm -hmm. um, but I do agree, like having, um, let's say, syntax in your type signatures where you say, oh, I take an argument of uh, int dot dot int or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I just use your normal like class mm. type syntax. That's what I do. Like like the syntax, if you want yeah, to range same. as an argument, it's just in your range flat brackets int. Or well, it's no longer yeah. generic, so just yeah. range now. But. And and for the iterator case, also like 
just use specialized methods, do like yeah. iterator.range and that thing takes two integers and be done. I mean, yeah, uh, on the topic of, of generic or non-integer ranges, uh, you mentioned earlier also um, um, the um, in Scala, uh, it was tried to make it work for like six to seven years and it has been a complete disaster. It was the, the class. I, I think the class still exists. It's incredibly complicated, and I think it's still not correct. So if you put what in the right, sorry, what class? I think um, not sure what's the name. Inclusive range of T or something, uh, and um, it has so many issues. Uh, is this basically if you plug in the right numbers, it gives you incorrect results. I think there. So I am not sure about any, but I think they just min and max the, conditions and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly an overflow, and you have like because you have like this thing where you can say one, two thousand by and then a step value you basically have this one two something which creates a range and then the by creates a range from that range before and has to do all kind of uh, weird things to it, it's it, it has been a complete mess it, it, it turns out that api design is nowhere near as easy as as people make it out to be that's right yeah yeah, I think yeah. back on all the times and places where I do range like things. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing a for loop over a range, it's because I want the iterator to index into several unrelated arrays. And I need the same iterator value, the same index value for multiple parallel arrays. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, you know, I do range as somebody said for like error checking things like the month is in one dot dot 12 because I want to just say one dot dot 12 is a nice convenient representation for the range for a month. I would hope that would compile away to an if though. I'm sorry? I would hope that compiles away to an if, not a for loop. Oh yeah, well, uh, uh, Cameron and I talked about having this fun fun version of syntax for, see, I need another code block. I'll go grab uh, the one in the middle here. Was that the switch for, one? Double-ended, no, double-ended tasks. Uh, I love that your example was an inclusive yeah. range. <laughs> Oops. Let's see. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so, so use it all the time. I love this one. Right. This is a, it's a syntax for doing a, a test of a value in the range, but just has a staggered set. Like the guy in the middle is used in both in the left and the right relation. And the left and right relations have to be all equal, equal, or all greater equals in order, in monotonic order. But you could have a stack of them in there that says they're all ordered, not just month. But so we let you mix less with less than equal and greater with greater than equal, but you can't switch any of the lesser ones with any of the greater ones and yeah. vice versa. Yeah. yeah, totally. Right. If A less than B less than C and things like that. So all, all and for me, this covers what I would otherwise use a range for when doing error checking of things. And then I the don't- nice thing, The nice thing with a range and a for loop is that the compiler knows how to, how to optimize it so it doesn't actually do any virtual nonsense or any crap like that. So it's like, if it's a constant range, it's, it's as simple as you'd write an assembly. And if it's a non-constant range, that is, you know, it's, it's opaque what the range is until runtime then you know it knows how to get the the lower and upper and but and... i think that's true already without needing any syntax for a range right but i'm saying specifically it would never use an iterator um uh, i think you can oh. achieve simple results through uh inlining and the usual optimization i know that rust if you write uh, iterators and there are probably some limitations but you know your conventional iterators they as far as I remember, they essentially compile down to a regular for loop, and that then gets you know further optimized. Uh, yeah, I don't I, know the if, Rust. I don't know the Rust equivalent, so it's hard to. But I, I would expect that that would certainly have been a goal. So yeah, it makes sense. So I, I wrote <laughs> a, a for loop here. 
uh, guarantee, you know, I can't spot guarantee, you know. So as long as your lower higher bound and, and stride are loop invariant, you're, you're going to get what you expect out of the machine code. Now, do I need a, a, a range for this same guarantee and same code? No, not really. It's maybe it's slightly more verbose than uh, having a range there, but maybe not. You know, the, the I wrote a for loop, but suppose I did an iterator with a for that it does, you know, is a range low, what how are you gonna do, comma high, comma, you know, step. Is that cleaner? Maybe. As soon as I'm fiddling with I in the middle of the loop, I'm I'm out of range of standard for loops and now I kind of care less about how the loop is structured. The for loop doesn't necessarily help me a whole lot as a clean way to understand iteration in order over a set of indexable things. And I'm all happy to go to a while loop and say, well, something horrible happens to the iterator here as I'm walking through. Like I'm doing a filter copy or a sort or something stupid and I bounces around. How often do people actually use step? Because I've used it twice in my life, but you right. know, I've only written a couple million lines of code. So <laughs> I, I'll it, claim not so. twice, but a ratio. But the ratio is pretty freaking small. Hmm. Step I, in the triangle. What's, what's it? I okay. think in I, I think the last like twelve years, I used it once, which was like a few months ago to explain my partner something. Like she was doing some exercise in Python where you have like range backwards and then you yeah. have to specify your step size is minus one minus so one, the yeah. step size is still one it was just in yeah. reverse okay so order. break out minus one and one from all other numbers like if we did I, I think like never never right, right. so the answer <laughs> so is the place never, never no special syntax don't support it the place that where i run into good. that is in closure code because closure has a habit of saying here is my list where Things mod one mean this. Things mod two mean this. Right. Things mod three mean this. It's so rather than being assembly. a list of no, struct, it's common it in is assembly a... that you have mod zero. You have uh, zero one zero one. You know you have uh, alternating like keys and values. You're just going to stick them one after another. You're iterating by two. Yeah. yeah. Right. So but step two you was common in assembly. Step go away that, by doing a list of structs instead. In scientific computing, you do this all the time, but arguably, you often do this for things you should have the compiler do for you. So I'm thinking of things like stencil code when you have a for loop traversing a huge array, right? And you often want to block this into cache tile, cache size tiles. So we'll divide it into say 10 by 10 subarrays. And then you will be going through 10 by 10 and inside each tile you will go one by one. But again, arguably the compiler and com good compilers often do this cache blocking yeah. for you. I, I would say that here is Scala partition operators work great instead of for loops. Uh, okay, for, for Matt's case, I would say I don't need a language syntax support. I'm going to make the compiler cough up uh, I plus equals 10 hmm. somewhere in there to skip by 10. I have done your stencils you're talking about, Matt, before as well. And non blocking hash map, in fact, does key value pairs and so it has stride by twos totally in there. But, you know, is the case common enough that we need a special language syntax or can you just like say it only does once? And then there's a, there's a backwards case, which you do high and low reversed and, and minus ones for those. I think actually what could be more useful for those cases would be a syntax to create those cache block tiles, like something like Halite language has. Because then you can very quickly iterate on different schedules. And when you port the code between CPUs and GPUs, this is something you change like extremely often. This is a very, very common use case in scientific computing. It's more useful than a print statement, I have to argue, in the language. Wouldn't you go to like, I want to say recursive breakdowns, which give you all different scales of blocking and then they become yes eyes. yes yes but it would be useful to have a language syntax for those recursive breakdowns highlight has something like that and it's okay, very so very useful to, to, so, so, so the difference between language syntax is everyone has to suffer it whether or not anyone else uses it so you have to go write a syntax that doesn't stomp on anyone else's toes yeah they call it scheduling language 
but it's not like instruction scheduling. It's, it's literally breaking right. the declaration to different cache types, right. for example. H2O did the breaking behind your back. You just handed it a big array and under the hood, it broke it into parts. And you didn't write the language. Like the engineers who wrote H2O dealt with that one time to do the breakdown. In theory, yes, that, that's how it should work. But in, in practice, you often have extremely brittle performance optimization if you let the compiler just to do it once. It really varies a lot on hardware to hardware. Well, that was the point of recursive breakdowns was that in theory it was cache size performance invariant across cache sizes because some of your recursive breakdowns were always the right size for the cache. It also can vary at runtime depending on the deployment condition of the application as is, is your application the only one running on the computing node or maybe you are running in the cloud and you are sharing the cache with anyone else and this can change at runtime. This was H2O's bane, yeah, launch a hundred node cluster and 99 nodes finished in a few milliseconds and one guy's stuck sharing with a noisy neighbor and he's 10 times slower. Yeah, exactly. Looks like That's Simon a has a lot of stuff. Sorry, sorry, Cameron. I said, looks like Simon has a lot of stuff. Uh, oh, is he down below still going? See, I saw he was started. I'm not even ready yet. So I just keep. I, uh, if, I would uh, say that Simon is the most rigorous of us when it's trying oh, to. Yes. Point. <laughs> well, I'm not going to read your code. Just now, um, while well, he's working on that, I have a feel, yeah, feel free. free uh, yeah, I uh, I spent some time looking at the uh, well, so I decided that in my uh project I would adopt the sea of nodes uh idea. Yay, and I thought, another convert, <laughs> go up to three. <laughs> uh, so I thought I would go and read some and hopefully steal some ideas from the the open JDK compiler, the hotspot yeah. compiler, I guess. Yeah. And um, you know, there's a lot of code in there. And I thought, you know what? This has been going for a long time. Why don't I go look at the first commit in the Git repo, uh, which is uh, you know about 15 years old or so because it, it's like obviously it had been long standing when they moved to git so it's like one giant commit um you know what there's very little has changed lots has been added but yeah. almost nothing has changed yeah so that was pretty interesting and so i thought you know probably if i want to figure out which are the kind of things to look at first they're mostly in the old commit and then stuff that's like kind of fine tuning is kind of coming in the last 15 years i don't know if you agree with that idea oh i'm sure it's true i mean i haven't looked myself but i kind of got the feeling that big changes to the core of the compiler stopped when i left and they stopped for a long time and maybe they're moving again but as near as I can tell, like, oh, we dragged up this code. I got a version. The code two. size is doubled, I would say, roughly. I'm sorry, the code, the code size is doubled. It's almost purely addition. Yeah. There's almost no changes. Yeah. The, the core graph rewrite rules well support adding things. Um, and if you add them poorly, you get a whole ton of them. Uh, yeah. but you can just keep adding them and like string optimizations and shit like that. String yeah. append, string plus minus whatever, string builders, you can add a bunch of shit there and, and all of that. Yeah, it. there were there were some, you know, interesting, like, you know, I, I will say looking at the simpler stuff, well, I started by looking at the simpler stuff, which I can understand more easily, like, you know, you know um, the add the add node right so like yeah. or the uh, binary commutative you know whatever um stuff so you know that was interesting there's a few you know sort of cases that's like yeah okay you could see that it's like you can remove a couple ops if somebody does this weird formulation or that formulation but um, somewhere I, I have i have one, a, one of the things that one of the things that I wanted to sort of 
figure out is do you do in inlining i saw that there's something about in, inlines being speculative so do you kind of create a speculative graph of an inline and then decide whether to keep it is that kind of how that works um no so inline is done during parsing which is very arguably you know too late I and mean, too early you should do it but anyhow it's done during parsing um and there are a bunch of rules that that, that allow things that look like speculative inlining but you pay the cost of having the byte codes parsed and turned into ir but it's speculative in the sense that you throw an if test around it to confirm that you got the right thing and then if the optimizer later discovers that you cannot ever make this in line, then the test goes dead and the code gets thrown away at actually pretty low cost. So uh, okay, so 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 you just put an if statement and you say like if inlining this if, method, if the this then pointer is in. if the this pointer is a, is an instance of the foo class, then I must be calling the foo virtual call. So inline the body of foo's virtual call. Okay. So, so the inlining, when I say it's speculative, it's it's like the code makes a call that's either static or virtual. If it's static, you got it, you're done. If it's virtual, it's one of a tree of possibilities. So you do class hierarchy analysis, you discover there's only one guy. Hey, good, we can inline here. You discover there's a, a, a set of guys, but one's hot. So you do the instance of test saying, I got the hot guy. Here's the inline body. Else, make a virtual call to cover all the rest of the cases. Specifically, yeah. if you're talking about NIO and you have to do heat byte buffers versus direct byte buffers, you look for two hot cases. So, but doesn't that get all screwed up when you do global code motion and value numbering and your inline stuff ends up splattered everywhere? So, so, so the point of the sea of nodes is that shit gets splattered everywhere. So the semantics are carried by the edges and the edges say how things can be ordered and the ordering typically allows shit gets splattered everywhere. So yes, everything gets splattered everywhere and that's okay. In right. fact, that's what you want. That's the better performance. And so if you decide to, if you decide to kill, like make that branch where you inlined dead, then mm -hmm. um, basically when, when all I, the code that was splattered everywhere also goes dead unless it's shared. Yeah, you're you're getting closer. So there's an IR now. You, you just have a pro after inline, you just have an IR. It, it has program semantics all by itself. Ignore yeah. the Java, the Java bytecode. You just have an IR with semantics. Okay, there's an if test. The optimizer proves the if test goes dead. The control flow on the if side goes down to some merge point. The merge point has a region of a pile of fees. One arm went dead. All the fees silently pulled up, throw away the dead arm. The last use of a bunch of things happens now because they're not used by the merge point. So they're dead. They have no uses. They're dead. And the IR just eats up dead things by saying, I have no uses. You're dead. And, and he just lather, rinse, repeat on dead things until they eat up. So at very low cost, the dead code goes away. Along the way, when you inline some things, you may have value numbered them with other things. And so common code typically repeated inlines of the same thing are all very common and they get inlined together, folded up. They've got one dude, but he's got a bunch of uses. If the last use goes away, it does. If the last use didn't, it didn't. And he's still alive and gets used and whatever. So it's just standard program optimizing semantics after the inline, after parsing, right? So, so when you value number, say I have an inline and it causes a value number sharing, but it pushes it way up. Yeah. So like yeah. the range of the thing that would have been there, um, you know, gets really lengthened and then it turns out that I don't need it. Does it end up, is there any step where that range gets shortened back down or you uh, just end up, is that just a cost of inlining? It, it does get shortened back down. So, so what you're getting into is the difference between global value numbering with global code motion versus partial redundancy elimination. The two optimizations are not, uh, uh, one is not dominate the other. There's cases where either is better than the other. Typically, global code motion, global value numbering, in my experience, beats the hell out of PRE. And, uh, uh, and the, you know the incremental things you get out of PRE are so small it's just not worth running, especially in a, in a fast compiler. It's not worth running PRE on top of everything else. 
So I don't do PRE, I do this global code merging. Upon rare occasion, I will comment up something above uh, a dominant set of his, he's always commented up to above all his use cases, but there's a path through there where he's he doesn't get used anymore. Um, and so it was useless to compute him. And then that doesn't, that, that was a cost you paid. It had nothing really to do with inlining because it, it just had to do with how the structure of the code came. Inlining can make that opportunity happen, but if you kill the entire inline value, then that use went away and the global code motion will bring that guy back down. So, so you just run code motion again after. So you yeah, kind of have to do global code motion a few times. No, you, you run code motion. Here's the tricks. This is where you're missing with CM nodes. You run code motion at the end because it makes oh. a place for code where there wasn't one before. When you're doing these other optimizations, you have no place. So there is no code, there's no motion because there's no place. Code doesn't have a place, uh, it can't be moved from one place to another. There's no motion possible. You can't even think about the concept of motion here. That's the trick. Once you're okay. past where you're doing the core optimizations and you have this sea of nodes, the global code motion brings you back a place. So, so uh -huh. basically during the core optimizer, there's no basic blocks. There is right. a right. Yeah. you can pick out, but there's no basic blocks. And and you just in you don't actually insert in your paper you show basic blocks, but you actually do region nodes, right? You just do yeah. and it's it they're like uh like um are they like a dependency and structure like how are they structured in there? Is it is it like a value if it's tied to a basic block is actually there's no basic block, so no values tied to a basic block. Oh, sorry, region. Okay. I mean. It's 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 a it's the thing to wrap your head around. So yeah. if you pull up the 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 earlier slides I did right before I left, I was showing some regions. I don't know if I can do that. I was hoping to get to Simon today because he's had some stuff for a while, and we've been we've been postponing. Yeah, yeah, I I can ask this stuff next time too. It's it's fine. Yeah. I'm not going to have a chance to develop on this now. I was just filling time. He's still typing. Okay, fine. <laughs> Well, I'll go a little further here. So a region node can conceptually be thought of, of a point where two control flows merge at a basic block and the fee nodes are at the head of that very basic block, the merge values from either side, but people who use that fee node are not necessarily in or, or not in that basic block. So the, the, the concept of I'm running code motion more than once doesn't actually happen. I throw away the concept of place. I optimize on the graph. I reinvent a concept of place as global code motion right before the end. And, and now having a concept of place, I can now do register allocation. I can do instruction scheduling followed by register allocation. And, and those are not possible on the C of nodes as a C because there's no place. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had another question about this. Sorry. Um, I was a couple of questions about SSA. So <laughs> I told you, I think in the beginning that I had SSA in my thing. Well, I didn't, I just didn't understand SSA, but I went and did the Braun SSA algorithm. Yeah. And I've it's got it in one. there go now. Pardon me? It's the wrong algorithm, but go for it. Can yeah, well, that's question. what I realized afterwards that I might have used the wrong one and I might have to do it again. So, um, which is okay. It didn't take that long, but the, the, I, I, um, I presented on this guy on this, on this meetup a few months, a month ago, a talk on building SSA form from parsing normal code. And that algorithm is super fast, super efficient, super easy. It's like stupidly simple. Um, you know, it's it's yeah. Eho Sethi Ullman's dag building on an expression done with basic blocks. And that gets you yeah. a safe form that is fast. It's not minimally optimal, but you don't care because the optimizer is going to chew you up anyhow. Right. It's just okay, so, easy. So I think I'll probably switch over to that because I like my code to be simpler. So it's okay. It's way um, simpler. And then, um, so then the... Uh, so that's in one of the recent top, like CCC. Yeah, recordings. yeah. yeah. Let's go find the slide again here. Yeah. I put the link from the video. You put the link in. Oh, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. 
and and so then the the other thing that was confusing me is if i'm going out of ssa form say um you know the ssa the five blocks get chewed up a little bit as well and it seems like every thing in a file doesn't show up in the notation and papers but it actually needs to be tied to a source block like yeah. every value in the every argument to the phi has to actually know where it comes from so it can go yeah. back there later so, so and so then the, what the trick and here, then when they go ahead the trick here is you don't come out of ssa form but at the end don't you do right like when no. you're no, I run Generate. SSA all the way out the back end to where I'm actually emitting, you know, hard x86 instructions. Yeah, now, I was gonna say eventually you have to do code generation. Yeah, I have to do code gen too, right? I, I also have basic blocks. So what what I get out of global code motion is I get basic blocks that are added to the SSA. But I keep SSA because it gives me cheap defuse edges, which like the allocator totally uses while he's doing allocation. That's part of building live ranges for graph coloring and yada yada. There's some anti-dependencies have to go in for load store anti-dependencies and other shit going on. It's really convenient to have those use step edges. So I keep them around. That means I have basic blocks with phi nodes in it. Now, phi nodes don't emit any code. So when it comes to code emission time, they just blank. But uh, they, they're in the basic block structure. Okay. But the, you still have to move the writes up into the basic blocks where they come from right so even though you still have the phi nodes there must be something being sort yeah, of spit out. Phi, all the nodes and edges stay now i also come through and i say for every node it belongs to some basic block so i build a control flow graph of basic blocks and the basic blocks contain nodes and i i believe i kept a reverse edge to make life easy go from node back to a basic block but i basically collect things in the basic blocks using global code motion. And I have a control flow graph of basic blocks with a list of instructions. And each instruction itself has def and use edges to and from all its neighbors. So, so, is, so it sounds like I should be having a look at the code in the register allocator in hotspot as well. Is that not, not anytime soon. That guy does a really great job and it does a really complicated job. So he's not easy at all. I would, if you're going to go down that path, I would rather have you write a, a Briggs Chaton allocator and know what the hell one is before you figure out what the hell that guy's doing. Because he's a Briggs Chaton allocator plus, 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 plus. He's got a lot of shit going on in there. A, a what allocator? Sorry. Br Briggs Chaton. Uh, Briggs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me go. Find bridge chain here. Uh, okay. So this is different from a graph coloring. No, no, it's 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 an it's an actual graph coloring allocator as opposed to <clears throat> there's a bunch of papers on it uh, floating around here. It's basically Chayton. It's basically graph coloring followed by Briggs's optimizations observations. And then I have a bunch more that follow that. Um, here is at least a Wikipedia article on Briggs Chaton. Um, the the I think that's Chaton. It might do Briggs in the end. But but this is a graph coloring allocator. So so do a graph coloring allocator. Know what the hell one is. Then I can start. So I have a one. Oh, you do. You you wrote it. Yes. Oh, excellent. Okay, yes. that's a long conversation I about a... what I did over Briggs Chaton which doesn't okay. necessarily help you unless you're into like, it's time to do nitty gritty, super good code generation. Yeah, I'm not there yet because I don't have the really good, uh, like I have basic compilation, but yeah. virtually no optimized. optimization yet. Yeah. Yeah. You need an optimizer for it's worth having a better allocator. And but also, also it seems like if you can't allocate well, then your optimizer is gonna screw you up um oh no no but 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 your performance is the sum of you know the the the, the hot spots code volume which is what your optimizer didn't remove plus what your allocator stuck in there and so 50 yeah. 50 you want to beat on the optimizer you want to beat on the allocator 
but it's easier to beat on the optimizer all at once as a standalone thing and then incrementally tweak it up for a while until it becomes clear that your register allocation sucks so bad that future work in the optimizer doesn't actually, you know, buy you anything to you clean the register allocator. Yeah, okay. Then we go down the register allocator path. And I've been a long time at it and it let my optimizer, you know, go rock and roll and a lot more aggressively and make progress that turned into, you know, real performance. The, the usual story with allocators is that once they hit a certain volume of code, they start to spill and then one good spill deserves another. And you get more code by inlining. And so you fix the allocator overspilling by under inlining. And I fixed my allocator overspilling, and then I can't over inline. So I can inline to my heart's content, and that turned into a lot of performance. Yeah, yeah, that's that seems like it would be good for my application. Right. Yeah. From what I remember, where you're at there, sure. So, so going down the allocator path is a long path, is a long piece. What happens in the hotspot allocator is, you know, two parts hacks for speed and two part hacks for Knowing that I have high quality profile data and you know, two part hacks for I can do better than just a standard bridge chain. So there, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't start on it right away. So instead, I would say first I have CF nodes, then I got basic blocks with instructions in them, and I have def use edges to make my life convenient. So I have SSA also. But now throw it in my current allocator because I have basic blocks and a pile of instructions and thus I should be able to allocate on that. Um, and then, you know, once that's going, go back to the sea of nodes and optimize the crap out of it using the, the sea of nodes things it does well. And then you can go back and visit the allocator when it's time. Okay. All right. Well, maybe Simon's yeah. ready now. Yeah, I'm ready. Summer, I'll go. Yeah. So, um, shall I share? Um, um if we can do that. You got you got your your annotations turned off. The editing was a pain in the butt. Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I I uh, I uh, try, try disabled all notification. Yeah, yeah. Try it now. Yeah, let's try it. There it goes. All right, so um, I, I thought I bring you up to speed uh, what I've done in the recent weeks. So first of all, uh, I finally decided to build a language I was uh, theorizing about. So Congrats. that's a decision that I will probably regret sooner than later. But <laughs> I mean, uh, what do we have to lose in the end? It's just... Uh, it will worth it, I'm sure. Hopefully, <laughs> and um, um, I basically uh, so most of the work is done by other people. I, I took a language uh, I was uh, contributing to uh, previously, and um, yeah, I think the language um, the original author had more of a vision going into a Rust-like style with uh, with garbage collection and um, I had a different philosophy so what is the uh, name of your language have you named it uh, you... yeah that's uh, I thought if Google gets away with go and carbon I can do core and core okay yeah. okay and um, so to not be quiet about this, the language I derived this from is called Dora by uh, Dominic Infur. So if you are interested in a more Rust-like uh, style of language, please uh, have a look at his work. It's uh, Should we explore him? Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he can build uh, amazing backend uh, stuff and uh, garbage collection and runtime and everything. I mean, he is single-handedly built like 99% of it. And uh, I, yeah, okay. that's, that's really congrats, hard. Congrats for the Dora language designer. Yeah, yeah, he does, uh, does a really great job. Even if you have different philosophies, I mean, that's why we that's why we have open source and the yeah. ability to fork. 
Um, yeah, and yeah, there's a website, but uh, it's basically uh, uh, a long time ago, I uh, uh, built some minor things for the IO language and uh, which also has an open source uh, website on GitHub. So I asked the author whether he would mind whether I could just uh, steal his design. He said no. So I went with the low cost approach of just trying to reuse as much code as possible. Mm. Um, yeah, so um, I've been busy. Um, I think uh, some time ago I talked about unified condition syntax that obsoletes having three different constructs, if then else, ternary operator, switch case, and so on. And I implemented the simple cases and this now works. This is now a test case. You see it's like an if with multiple branches. And in this test case, I also nested ifs that, into that, each that other. Means take the expression from the if and repeat it. It's value. Exactly. Yeah. So we first compare ABC to BCD. That's false. We compare it to not ABC. That's also false. We compare it to size equals three. That's true. So um, we just take DEF and compare it to things and then it turns out the result is four and that's what we get out of it. So what's missing there is all the rest, like all the pattern matching, the exhaustiveness checks, the, the binding magic that will probably take some time to uh, evolve. But that's pretty much the vision I have uh, for this feature. Um, apart from that, um, on my quest to uh, kill operators, <laughs> I'm happy to report that I got rid of yeah. Boolean uh, exclamation mark and integer exclamation mark. So yeah, integer bitwise negation and Boolean negation is both gone. Yeah, I, I um, yeah. so... Um, so instead of having like this random uh, single symbol that takes whatever is behind it and negates it, you can now read left to right and then you have like a not call. I'm planning on eliminating the braces and that's pretty much it. There's not much more going on. So some operation, some operators killed and replaced with methods, which is a win in my book. Um, also, I killed binary do you plan operators to do this for handling or also. Uh, no, I uh, keep that. For uh, um, you mean bitwise and and bitwise or? Yes, I meant bitwise, not logical. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, um, you can do this, but uh, it's. I mean, it's already uh implemented. You can already do this. But I think um, it's I you don't have to overdo it. I think uh, it's reasonable to cut down a bit where it's worth it, and say in other cases, uh, well, no, let's not touch it. Not uh, let's not touch it to make people. Uh, uh, let's, let's keep people uh, not too unhappy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll just watch and see how it works out. Maybe I'll start hating it in two weeks and I'll have to think about it again. And in this case, uh, the only uh, unary operators left are plus and minus for numbers. And I hope to eliminate them uh, rather soon by uh, folding them uh, into the inter integer literals. So you can still write integer literals, but you can't write this anymore. Yeah, or we'll I'll probably support this it anymore. Yeah, Sorry? That one is, I'll probably, I'll, I will probably support the plus number version, but I'm with you that it's kind of weird. Uh, it's sort of useless. Yeah. I, Rarely use it when I'm making columnar interesting things where I wanted the plus to be aligned so you can see 
that here it's positive and there it's negative a little more clearly, but it's what, not. Steve, but what do you mean the integer promotion operator is not useful? <laughs> I'm sorry, a plus I, number. I call it, yeah, I call it the integer promotion operator because in C, it actually promotes integers, which you can use to some nasty <laughs> things. Oh, I see. No, I wasn't thinking it was gonna- Simon, promote. you don't wanna do that. <laughs> no, no, absolutely yeah, not. Don't, don't copy C. Mm, yeah. That's a good principle, actually. And um, the, the reason why I'm actually uh, not that concerned about getting rid of that is, uh, first of all, um, it gets less, less confusing re uh, to read because uh, you don't have to wonder, okay, to which part of the following expression does this minus apply to? With a method, it's completely obvious. And I mean, you have enough uh, um, other options to uh, like negate a well, number. Well, about to... zero minus as opposed to minus one times a number? Either zero. zero... Yeah, that that's absolutely yeah, that's absolutely fine too. Yeah. Or I mean, um, because not every uh, um, number can be negated. Uh, I'm also thinking of doing something like uh, uh, it's that turns an option of int. Huh? So it could negate a number or it couldn't. And then you have have enough options to do exactly what you I, want. I would I would claim that you should stay big. Well, you're doing that's fine. Yeah, but for me it's like you're doing big integer or not. Okay, you're doing two's complement, then overflows and wraps. Um, if you're doing and if you're not, then you make some special syntax change to say. And here I switch to big integer, and you're the same thing you're doing here. And here I switch to dot negate form, which gives me an option which blows up when computing the absolute value of min int. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will, we will see how it works out. Very, very un, unusual to need to worry about it, but it happens occasionally. For, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, people can just ignore it and can use this, or if they really care about and they have a number that can't be totally uh, negated, then they get the option for that. And if the number is a float, the negate option might just be float or not option of float. So we are flexible there. Um, the other thing I did is uh, dropping bit shift operators. Um, they uh, have been on my kill list for quite some while. I, um, the, the for one reason is that we have uh, operators for bit shift, but not for rotate, which is yeah, kind of silly. And I have some suggestions that... if you want rotate suggestions. Oh God! All right, <laughs> I, I have a comment. It's really quick. Like yeah, I, yeah, sure. Useful with shifts and rotates. I'm making hash codes. It's a very narrow use case. I'm happy to import bits and say bits dot shift left and bits dot shift right. That would be fine. Bits dot rotate. Yeah, that's that's completely valid. I think. Um, yeah. The the other reason I I really dislike bit shifts is that. Uh, opposite of uh, uh, shift left is not this one, but this one. And it's completely infuriating for me, at least. Um, it's it's so incredibly inconsistent and I can never remember it when I need it. And um, the, the replacement for this stuff is just methods. You so I have- assembly. Sorry? There's enough assembly doing array indexing math. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, true. I mean, if you're doing that a lot, it will be more painful. Um, so what, I had I had to do some of this stuff in when I was designing what I was working on, and what I decided for the triple uh, arrow there is unsigned. So I just did uh, instead of three arrows, I did a letter U, yeah. and then two arrows. Yeah, I've seen that. Or Z, uh, Z two arrows or U two arrows yeah. zero yeah 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 mm -hmm. so I didn't I left the 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 signed the same so basically shift right is not signed or unsigned it's it's doesn't matter w whether it's signed because you're you're shifting it sorry uh, shift it's right just, yeah and then for rotate what I did is I did oh. uh, um, 
uh, greater than dash greater than and less than dash less than. <laughs> mm. Well, here's here's uh, maybe Cameron's Is rotations. Cameron's yeah, suggestion. I, I, I lost oh, very similar. I the last the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. what yeah. you can do with Unicode. I mean, if you go into the other directions, uh, in the other direction, why not own it and go full way? Yeah. No. <laughs> I wrote my rotate in Java as a pair of shifts and an or followed by a function call and I say dot rote when I went rotate. Mm. Um, I've done that too, yeah. Yeah, but it's only like I said, it's only used for hashing, so it's only in this very narrow. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 core insight I had after I did migrate the code was, uh, I first the worry was okay, I have this binary operator and it's convenient and nice, and if I replace it with the method, I not only have the method name, but I have the dot before the method name and the parents after the method name. But it turned out that uh, that uh, people are so afraid of precedence, they add the parents anyway. So the net cost of replacing the operator with a method is just this part and not the parents. And yeah. that was a nice insight that I didn't think of before. There are, there are some definite tragedies with uh, operator precedence in C, C++, and Java. Yeah, uh, I, I yeah I also fixed that a while ago, so it, it works as as expected. Um, yeah, I mean uh, it's it's of course it's not as convenient as the operators, but also it's it, it was less painful than expected, and that was already more than I hoped for because in the end uh, I'm willing to take a convenience hit if I get back a simpler language. And um, I think in this case, with the weird triple right and double right, it's a win. Mm, I, on <laughs> related note, I also implemented named arguments and decided that are purely for readability. So if you want to name, if you have a class with two arguments, X and Y, you can put the names down there if you think it's helpful. Yep. And I, oh, sorry. No, I agree. Total. And I was uh, thinking, um, okay, wouldn't it actually be nice to annotate the declaration side to say, okay, um, all callers should always uh, use um, a named argument. And that's, of course, uh, the job of an annotation. So uh, I haven't implemented it, but... Uh, it would basically look like this, and then only this line would be valid, and this line would be valid because a compiler would say, "Okay, you uh, have this call. It's correct from a type perspective, but uh, adding the name here is required." And you don't allow argument shuffle. I see in your last example. exactly. Yeah. That so, was a little, uh, it's sorry. A little strange. It's a little strange if they're giving all the names. Yeah. Why does the order matter? Yeah. Um, and the, 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 um, the core lesson is that um, it saves a lot of heuristics. So uh, back in the Scala days, they had some really, really weird restrictions on where you could uh, place the named arguments. And I felt it was never, never worth it, especially if you are allowed to reorder the arguments the next question that comes up is uh, what's the uh, uh, what's the uh, order of uh, oh evaluation evaluation is it the order you uh, you write it down or is it the the order yeah. um, uh, uh, that's on the uh, the feature example style? here I can't yeah, sure. to, to be oh. like you know y is equal to a plus plus and x is equal to b plus plus and then now are you adding one to A beforehand or a, Y is equal to A plus plus, X is equal to A plus plus. It's evil code. What's the order of evaluation? Yeah. It changes whether that you evaluate in the argument function order or argument expression. I would say you would do it in, in the express order you gave in place. Like change Y equals false to Y equals B plus plus as well. 
Mm. And now it yeah. changes whether X is zero or one according to whether Y or X evaluates before the other. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea is to basically do the bare minimum minimum to have named arguments with, without wasting okay. too much intelligence yeah. or too much code on all the heuristics you could do. But uh, then smart people uh, come up with a piece of code of saying, well, this looks actually quite reasonable, but the compiler rejects it. The compiler shouldn't reject it. Uh, why don't you add this another 50 lines of code to make the compiler recognize this? And um, yeah, I don't really see uh, see the okay. point of that. So now, now, you have, now you have to do default arguments. Because yeah. in my head, one of the main uses for named arguments is if I have a some sort of builder selector thing yeah. and it's got 50 arguments and everyone takes 90% of the defaults and updates one or two, right? And so they want to have skip all the extra args, take the defaults, but they want to mm -hmm. name some guys that are different from the default. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I, uh, the... I think uh, for me personally, uh, uh, named arguments uh, is more important than default values. But um, yeah, I'm. So it's I, not about importance, though. It's 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 uh, it's it's not that one is more important than the other. It's that one enables the other. True. Yeah. That's, Without that's named correct. arguments, you can't have default arguments. Right. right. Ah, well, you can leave off the the tailing ones. Yeah, that's always ugly because they're never yeah. the right order of I them. mean I mean the the what's the 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 question uh um default values uh create is that uh where where the default is stored. So if you're calling a method that has default values for a parameter and um you change uh value at the definition side but don't recompile the call side which default value is used the one uh, from the from when you compiled the call side or the one that still exists the new one from the definition side and that has a lot of impl implications on compatibility so that's yeah. why it's it's a lower priority for me because there are more unsolved issues well, with that that's yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the reasons to do it, though. You put them I mean, on the call side. So it, I no, I not so, the call side. I'm sorry. Put them on the definition. I'm sorry. Put them yes, on the definition. Put it, so the linker, basically, it's the linker's job. Is the point? It's not the it's not the compiler's mm. job. It's the linker's job. I mean, the C sharp uh, took the approach to uh, to not uh, consider new uh, or like to not consider the definition side but what you wrote at the yes. time you compile the call side yes. and i think they also did this because they are really really scared to to break things for people so basically uh, you update the default value at the definition side and suddenly colors will fall apart and i think c sharp really really wanted to avoid this so i i would Give you an unpopular opinion, which is most of the decisions made in C sharp were wrong. But um, <laughs> it is, it yeah. is not that is not a lack of respect for the people involved, who are far more brilliant than I am. I just think that they made very bad choices. Uh, and I think the 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 um, the biggest problem with C sharp is not the choices they made, but the amount of choices they made. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. it's like it's amazing there how no, there are no Bjorn, but. They, yeah, they are close. They are really trying to. One good complexity deserves another. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. If if you're thinking of putting it on the caller side, then don't do it. Yeah. Only do default parameters if you put it on the definition side. Right. Yeah, that would that would be my approach too. And then you can so. add more arguments, and no one else breaks. That they all got default. So values. the benefit the benefit of the default arguments is something like what I just showed here with a with a with, these are called withers on in uh, functional programming where you can basically take an immutable object and replace a, any subset of the fields, right? So instead of having, let's say that there are 40 things instead of, I, I found a short example so it would fit. Yeah. There are six here, but there could be 40, right? So basically what you're saying is, okay, I wanna create a new one by copying an old one, but I only wanna change the white space information, right? Like, or whatever, like I wanna change the, the tokens value, right? 
And so all you have to do is say, you know, with value equal new value, and you get back a new token. That instead of in Java, you would have 612 um, methods instead. Yeah. Right. It's kind of the same thing with the copy operator. Yep. Yeah, absolutely the same thing. And um, one thing, so that's all I, I want to keep the want to keep uh, named arguments really, really simple because my main focus is on uh, improving readability, uh, giving people tools to improve the readability yes. of their code there, right? It's but, really uh, nice and it, it does help much more than I thought it would. And particularly, particularly Booleans. Because you'll have you'll have five Boolean options on something, yeah. and being able to put the name in in the call site does such a nice job of yeah. explaining why you're passing false, false, true, true, false instead of true, false, true, false, true. Yeah, usually I'm on the team that says just use enums, but uh, looking at code, I think even if you eliminated all the Boolean blindness with enums you'd still have a lot of worthwhile places to use named arguments. Yeah, so basically I try to keep the, I try to keep it simple, but I have one nice trick up my sleeves that I haven't implemented yet. Uh, that is um, named, uh, with, if you have named arguments, you can have multiple uh, var arc parameters uh, in, Languages in many languages, you can only have var arc uh, parameters at the end because it's like you can't have right. many. Yeah. Sure, the reasons but are obvious. It's only interesting to have different lengths because otherwise it would turn the, the parallel arrays into a, a little mini struct of Paris, comma, sure. France, and Berlin, Germany. And yeah, sure. I, I mean, that's, that's like a, a really made up example, yeah. uh, but it, imagine that you have like have a constructor that takes tuples and you have a constructor that takes like two lists and then you have maybe a convenience constructor like this that takes two var arcs and with named arguments it just works you can just say okay my named var arc keys has these values and my named var arc wells has these values and um i hope to implement that right yeah. let's see i have no idea right. well i mean it takes like two brackets though you just put braces around the keys and braces around the values and then you have two lists and it's not hard yeah, yeah sure sure yeah yeah maybe it, it will it's a pointless gimmick then i can always remove it but yeah I mean, if the language has var arcs, and I believe that they should work in all positions. So making them work in all positions is, from my perspective, not adding a feature, but uh, resolving an inconsistency mm -hmm. that other languages have. And yeah, let's see if it's actually useful. Not sure. And uh, the last thing uh, I wanted to show, so this is all pretty theoretical. Um, I talked in the past about these definitional enums where the core idea is that my enum uh, values refer to existing uh, types in scope and not saying, okay, my password validation problem now defines three members. So this is like an implements. So the thing that comes after the implement after the implements refers to existing stuff. And in these cases, I have made up a silly example. Um, password to short, password to long, password to simple that refer to these three classes. And um, we discussed before that um, we have this um, nice convenience that we don't need to wrap these um, types into a pet if the expected type is a pet, but the compiler can do it automatically. And the core insight I had was that, hey, we 
can not only do this for input uh, values, but also for result values. And um, one example where I think this uh, enables some new things that are really, really interesting is uh, uh, error elimination. So in Java, you have like, if you're, um, if you have like a check password strength method, you might say, okay, it returns a string or throws three exceptions, password to short, password to long, password to simple. And then you can catch them individually, but you have to pray that nobody just writes, throws exception and discards all the exception information you had before. And Rust does it uh, with results where you have this enum and then you have all define all the the enum members uh, with like these uh, syntactic wrappers that refer probably to some struct somewhere. And it's a bit unwieldy, I think. And the core insight I, I, I made is that, okay, we have this method check password strength and it returns either a string or a password validation problem and we have some code there that just does that. Like if the size is small, then we complain the password is too short and return like a new password suggestion. So nothing too exciting. So what I'm what I'm what I want to show is that because um, our password validation problem uh, refers to existing types and doesn't define them, doesn't own them, we can define uh, new enums that basically say, okay, uh, instead of these three, um, uh, let's say the, the, it has just these. So my new password length problem shares some members with um, my more general password validation problem, but I basically save all the boilerplate I'd have to do in Rust, for instance. And what I can then do is say, okay, I have a fix method that says, well, I get a password validation problem in and I either return the fixed string by using the suggestion if the password is too simple or I pass on the existing problems. And at this point, uh, I'd argue that the compiler should be smart enough that it can recognize that I have a problem of type password validation problem. I eliminate one case and uh, what's left is... Uh, mm -hmm. Ziglang is doing something like this with integer error codes from like yeah, yeah. OS calls. Yeah, yeah. so I basically argue uh, if I can have this magic wrapping at input positions, it also should work for return positions. So I'd say, okay, I have this yeah. password validation problem type, I eliminate one and then I can simply return the problem and the compiler will acknowledge that, okay, this problem Close can now that. be password too short, password too long. Yeah. So this type is correct. You have, you have a closed set of things and you remove one of the choices. So you have a smaller set and the compiler knows yeah. the entire smaller set. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the, the transition from this password validation problem to the password length problem is seamless. So I don't have to unwrap it and then rewrap it. And I think that's uh, a very interesting approach that I haven't seen in exactly that way. So yeah. Let's see how, how long it takes to mm. ever get there implementation wise. For sure, you will be, you will have to deal with uh, what we discussed with your record about our matching, what type overloads, what type doesn't overload, does one type subsumes the other. For sure, you will have to deal with this here. Yeah, yeah, will be a lot mm. of problems I'm ill-equipped to handle. Well, Isn't this narrowing the set of possible 
values or types what mm -hmm. no. the type lattice thing does in the hotspot yeah it narrows the set this is this is actually just set elimination he's got a set of things he tests for uh, uh problem being the the too simple so he had three things he says is it too simple on the else clause on the you know function fix password too simple on the else clause you only got two left I think the uh, the latter stuff in hotspot is largely uh, um, relying on subtyping or inheritance, but apart from that, is it that different? Are you talking about subtyping? When you say hotspot, you're talking about subtyping in Java? Or are you talking about no? Uh, 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 what uh, what Derek mentioned with uh, he said it's similar. Isn't it similar to what a hotspot does? When you say hotspot, you mean Java, or do you mean the hotspot compiler, or what are you talking about? Did you talking about Java? I think uh, uh, I was talking about the compiler, the hotspot compiler, the lattice okay. piece. It has Very a lattice good. piece that lattice is used, types. yeah, to decide what partial knowledge he can gather, and he improves his partial knowledge over time. Isn't that kind of what this is doing? Mm. Um, here it's a more specific thing, but yeah, the, the, the lattice and hotspot in the compiler does like, for instance, a range for integers, and he knows when you've chopped the ends off the range and can reduce a range, but he doesn't do an arbitrary pile of bits. It's not identical. Here you have an arbitrary pile of bits. You remove one of the bits with your if test, the remaining, you have one less bits possible. And it has to work the other way too. For example, the um, with the fixed two simple password, you remove one, but uh, you have to figure out that the remaining parts constitute the types define it. Yeah, which which type is the best? Go, I think that have I haven't. Reverse. I haven't uh, s sorted it out yet. Right. So uh, you have a have a password length problem, but you could have a you know password. To yeah. S problem, which is too short or too simple. So yeah. structural typing, typing just creeping in here slowly. Uh, There's no best I, answer for how you. I mean, decide. I mean, the the benefit is that because the um, the types here are completely unrelated to any kind of enum, mm -hmm. I can just ask, okay, which enum is in scope? Did I import an enum that would fit? Uh, the I said that would work as a result type, and if I have an enum, I can take that. And if I have two enums that would both be valid, I can just say the compiler uh, errors out. So uh, add a type annotation. I I really dislike if the type inference goes backwards. So mm -hmm. try to avoid that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's the point of the type inference is to go both ways. If you add an annotation, then maybe you get an answer here, but uh, uh, password too simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I wanted to point out that you know, I mean, in general, like the the set of return values depends on the control flow. So like you have to yeah. do this. Well, you have to solve the halting problem to figure out the answer. Well, here yeah. in your case, you have a too simple and too long. <clears throat> And you don't try the halting problem. You give it up. And you say I have both a simple and a long, and I have two enums, one of which uh, doesn't have too simple, and the other does. So only one of the enums is allowed there. So the type becomes password validation problem and not password length problem. I mean, I I think your example makes more sense if it, if I do it like this, right? Is this what you meant? No, oh, it's if you do short, then you have a lattice where one is strictly smaller than the other, and so you take the tighter solution. So if you add a new enum, which is the password has two s's, you too much two s's, it's mm -hmm. either short or simple, then I can't tell if I'm returning a short whether you want a length problem or a, 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 an s problem. Um, what, what I really, I, I would really avoid uh, saying I, I'll take the tighter solution because uh, in the end, you extend an enum 
somewhere and then <coughs> suddenly uh, the code falls apart because suddenly the tighter enum is not yeah, tighter you, you than, you than the competing enum. So you haven't uh, added or, or shown that you can extend an enum, but if you were to add a new enum, the combination of new enums is so long, suddenly no longer has a best solution and is ambiguous. Yeah. So the act of adding the new enum would throw a compiler error saying this new code is ambiguous. That's that's what I really want to avoid. So adding I, code that... declares the new code ambiguous. No, uh, exactly that this cannot happen that I say um, I will only consider an enum return value that is actually imported. So um, this will not infer password length problem if password okay. length problem is not imported. So imported and, means that you put it in your current. And you're, yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm saying if in the code that you wrote already, if somebody comes along and where you said enum password length problem of blah blah blah, I added a new enum. Enum password has an S problem. Um, that new line of code makes the program ambiguous. Mm, in in what in what sense? Importing new code from somewhere else. That's not. I'm, I'm, I'm confused about what you're talking about. Like, like here I claim, oh, I can't edit here. I have to go back to the doc. So is the um, question whether the enums are a sealed class? Yeah. So, so, so I'm looking at what you can and can't do. And what he said is I have three things that are part of an enum. And the, the enums, are, the first enum, the validation problem is a sealed class with three choices. Password length problem is a sealed class with two out of the three choices. There's another one. Password S problem of you know too short, too simple, right? Hmm. Okay, so it's stupid, but there it is. Okay, so when I add this line, I uh, I cannot tell when you return a short whether it should upcast to a length or an upcast to an S problem because both would would qualify. So. Alan's issue where he says, if undecidable, return too short, too long. If I look, there's one tightest answer for too short, has both too short, too long. But if I have somebody who's just returning too short, I can't tell you that he's an S problem or a, a length problem because those guys represent overlapping sets and therefore there's not a, 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 a not a best that. answer argument you have to go structural in order to solve this problem mm -hmm. now you have to right somebody has to come I, and tell me what the hell they I, want i mm. now I, I mean i i'd reject it mm. um if like if either one enum is imported and that enum then this email enum is taken or you have two enums that are valid and imported and then the compiler just rejects it and says put the type annotation on there so here yeah. in the alone example, undecidable, I assume it have to figure out it at runtime with the alone no, example. No, no, the compiler should at compile time say it's a too short and a too long and nothing else. And, and, the, how, and, and there is a minimal tightest guy that has both too short and too long. That's a length how, problem. Yeah. So he should that's determine a, it's a length and problem. That, and that's a structural problem because you'd have to figure out what to yeah, how but to you could do that at compile time straightforwardly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I return too short and, and too simple, I'm going to say you're a password S problem. But if I were to say I'm returning too long and too simple, it's only a validation problem. So in all these cases, I can tell you what it is in this but particular exam, this particular from, operation. From the test, it cannot figure out which would type would recon. So we have to consider both. So we have yeah, to consider both. both. Yeah, the undecidable but, question problem just means you take both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, what do you do uh, with I mean, I two bits out of three? Can you come up with a minimal, obvious single guy? In this case, yes. As soon as I'm doing two bits out of yeah, the larger combinations of things, I can pretty quickly get into. I have multiple overlapping, all are valid, yeah. no one's minimal. I can't tell. Yeah, so don't do anything about it. Um, require either a type annotation or an import. 
or, or blow it up. Yeah. So your, yeah. your suggestion is. I mean, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even say this has to be undecidable. I would exactly do the same logic if we wrote false in there. Okay. Because yeah, I. And AAF specifically said if you write false in there, the code that's dead does not. Yeah. Count. Yeah, exactly. That's, I don't, basically, I don't want codes to have different kind of inference depending well, my, on my, whether my it, well, I figure out. If OS X, then do something else if Linux, else if Windows, and on the else branches, it'll have code that, for instance, incorrect deep, count of arguments. Deep in the weeds with this. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the, the Ziglang thing, I should have found the Ziglang thing. The Ziglang thing was pretty cool. They thought through this a bunch where you get a collection of error codes, just like your enums, and you can run sets together if they're using the same enum. Um, and they get a canonical larger set, and then they have some subsetting games that they think they've worked out fairly well. Yeah, yeah I, I looked it up after you mentioned it last time, and it was it was it was quite nice. I, I mean, it's yeah, quite okay. a smart thing to do. And why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, for for low level C hacking code on enums on error codes, it's exactly perfectly the correct answer. Um, all right, so um, that's basically all I wanted to show. Yeah. Sure. Congrats, Simon, for starting this. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end sharing here. It's getting... It's, I'm not sure. I, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. I'm I, I mean, it, I'm not sure. It's really congratulations or like... Uh, so, so you have the, the free ability to experiment with it, try some fringe ideas, some radicals ideas. Why not? It's your language. Mm. Yeah, true. But yeah, it, let's, let's see how much time I sink into this. <laughs> the main in, uh, in comparison to many other things that would probably be more worthwhile. But well, I, we, you have nothing to lose but your time and your sanity. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> In the end, okay. I'm working. Yeah. I'm working based on the uh, on the biggest motivation a human can have: proving other people wrong. Oh. <laughs> that. So we have had to start. Well, I claim that love and fun should be up there higher ah. than somebody wrong. I, I don't know. <laughs> Doing things out of spite is always. <laughs> and it's always nice to to be right in the end. Yeah, that's all that matters. Okay, guys. All right. On that happy note, I'm going to call it here. Anyone want to add any last words before I pull the plug? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Have a nice day. Is it on again next week or it's another week off? Uh, no, no. I'm on again now until I say otherwise. Okay. So we can go talk. SSA form and constructing it and when and where you code motion versus not and all that kind of shit. Yeah. And uh, I, what I did last time was um, the last couple of weeks is a sort of module import system and macro expansion. So it actually came out really nicely. Maybe I'll show it off a little bit. We can That's talk good. about it. Yeah. For sure. Next good. Yeah. All right. Till next week. All right. Bye. 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 Ciao.